uh, make it. So here we are, um, one hour session today. This is what we'll be uh, covering. As mentioned down here are the links. Um, this one here is the actual guide. Uh, this is part of the series of guides on systems innovation. We're actually right at the end of it um, and talking about yeah, how we assess for impacts. And then here, so that's the ideas there. You'll find the link um, if you click on that, the PDF, this is the canvas. Um, we'll be looking at here's another useful one we have on our website and here is a video I'll touch upon as we go through this gentleman um, we interviewed uh, not long ago on this very subject a very interesting one to take a look at um, so if you're interested in the topic of investing for systems change which is um, a bit of what we're talking about today I'd recommend that video so um, the, the two main factors we'll be talking about is assessment. Before we take an overview here, we'll be talking about um, measurements and assessment of um, systems change, whether what we're doing is actually changing the system rather than changing the parts. And then further down, how we might invest in that change um, in the right way. So that's that. And then as mentioned, a little workshop down here. So let's let's jump in and uh, see what we're talking about. So in any systems innovation initiative, uh, gaining some assessment of how our actions are affecting change in the system is of critical importance. We need to understand you know, where we are and whether what we're doing is having the right effects we want to have. And Ideally, are we moving closer to an actual systems change? Are we moving closer to a tipping point, which is kind of what we're trying to get when we're changing systems? Um, and this is quite different from our normal kind of assessment methods and approaches where we're typically just assessing changes to the paths um, in a somewhat linear fashion. So this is uh, like most of the stuff, it's a paradigm shift in how we go about doing assessment. A change in system structure rather than just its parts, implies a paradigm shift in our ways of assessing, measuring, and investing for systems change. Existing thinking and incentive structures create strong drives for many projects to demonstrate quantitative impact and outcome on specific issues. The result is that we often try to demonstrate systems change by demonstrating some quantitative change um, for a specific issue. They're normally actually just assessing the parts and how they're changing and not really changes to the system structure. So we'll talk about all of that. Um, it's quite challenging to even yeah, get our head around this new approach um, of system change and then to actually think about how to assess it and invest for it and so forth. Um, so this is what the guide covers. If you wanna take a look about afterwards, firstly measurement, um, investment, and then um, how do we focus on outcomes and achieving real impact and then also learning is part of this how does the system learn how to um, get better at, at changing and developing over time so that's a key part of it so what do we mean by impact impact is the effect that one thing has on another this term is used in the context of a change initiative to assess what effect our actions are having on the system we're interested in changing in a change initiative, uh, we have, hope to make progress in the desired direction, and we take actions to realize that. In order to make decisions about the best actions to take, we need to learn about the effects of our, of our past actions. That's where it kind of leads to the question of investment, right? If we understand what's working, we can understand where to invest our resources and be strategic. Our aim here is to gain um, relevant feedback about the state of the system and to assess whether what we're doing uh, is taking us in the desired direction or not. To do this, we need to define um, what aspects of the system we need to gain feedback about. We need to capture that information, amass it, assess it, its overall meaning as a basis for decision making about the future actions and investments. Um, that's why we're doing this. Um, so assessing the whole system Impact assessments for systems change differ qualitatively from non-systemic impact assessments, as we are now required to account for the changes in the whole system rather than changes in the parts. If our aim is to change the 
context, uh, then our impact assessment needs to be accounting for this rather than traditional metrics associated with linear changes and specific outcomes. Systems thinking is expan expansive and our assessment of systemic impact should be likewise looking outwards, not narrowing our vision down to a few key metrics, but looking across the broader system or systems. For example, if we're looking at an education system, we often rush to metrics like that of test scores. However, when ed education is taken in its full context, we see that it's as much about what happens outside of school as what happens inside. And we would need to be taking, uh, thinking about this broader context. So that gives an idea of what we're talking about here. A reductionist approach would look at you know, these specific test metrics, should we say, if we think systemically in a systems way about this, we look at the broader context, which is the whole um, context within which this person is learning and try to think about that. Um, so this kind of lays it out in quite a straightforward uh, dichotomy between, between the two. Uh, Non-systemic uh, impact and assessment is about changes in parts. It's quantitative in nature. Uh, it, it aims for direct outcomes, it's linear kind of thinking, um, key performance metrics, um, and it's quite symptomatic, um, really. Systemic impact assessment. System change about changes in the structure of a system. So that's what we really should be um, assessing here. And it's about improving the health of the system. So again, that's what we would really want to be um, assessing, how actually um, generative and healthy is the system and what is what we're doing actually contributing to that? Um, how integrated is it? Um, are we moving towards the emergence of new outcomes and tipping points? So those are the things we'll be assessing for if we're assessing for systemic uh, impact and system change, whether we're actually um, making a systems change. So it's about collective impact rather than individual effects. And this is part of what we struggle with because a lot of the way we do metrics is associated to individual organizations. And what, have, what has my organization or this other organization achieved? Um, when what's really needed to change a system is collective um, coordination, action, and thus we need to be investing and incentivizing and assessing for actually collective um, action. As such, it requires a realignment of our metrics uh, for impact assessment from looking at one organization or program to assessing the effects of the um, interaction between the collective. Too often the assessment and investment structures we develop have a built-in assumption that it's the parts that will create the change. This is demonstrated by the design of our funding, where we often hold the competitions between different projects to see which will We'll, we'll do best and we'll get funding to move forwards. However, system change requires alignment between many actors. Thus, we need to build accounting and investment structures that are designed to support and assess collective action. So I don't know if you've seen this map, the system by the Skoll Centre, um, it's done here in Oxford in the UK. Um, it's a good example of this, instead of investing um, inviting participants to pitch their solution, which is kind of a traditional social innovation approach. Um, they get them to map the system to find a way to bridge the gaps and improve the alignment of the actors and think about the whole system instead of just a specific solution um, to that. And yeah, it's a new paradigm for how we do uh, metrics. Um, this means that the existing metrics will likely be, to a large extent, um, irrelevant. I mean, it's good to know about how well the parts are doing, but if we're really assessing for the overall um, change, we'll need very different uh, metrics. The metrics that we use today are largely just measures of how well the existing system is doing according to its own criteria. criteria. We typically measure how well a system is working internally, not how well the system functions within its broader context. For example, we assess students um, based upon the content we think they should be learning and not on uh, many other criteria such as how well they are equipped with the skills they will need in life. So system change is going to involve a change in paradigm 
Um, and it's that change in paradigm that we should be assessing, not how well the existing system is doing at what, what, what it's set up to do. Uh, okay, so that was just a, a quick overview. Um, yeah, talking about actual um, measurements, this is what systems change, we're trying to do in systems change, right? This is a quote I took from Anna Bernie. Um, system change, the emergence of a new pattern of organization or system structure. And if that's what we're trying to do, we're trying to assess for whether we're getting better at doing that, whether we're getting closer to doing that. And we should be really assessing this here on the right hand side, this structural change within the system. The way the system is organized is what we want to be assessing um, rather than this here, which is on the left, which is what we're normally looking at. So, um, and it, it's a paradigm shift. That's, that's why it's very, very difficult. Um, we can't assess the system according to its own criteria. When we see systems change, it's never linear. It's always non-linear. And that means it's, it's exponential. Complex systems, they change by flipping from one state to another in an exponential non-linear way. That's when you get systems change. And it's a qualitative change in the whole structure of the system. Um, and that's something very difficult for us to think about. We're very used to a linear progression, thinking about change. If we stay doing this, if we keep on doing this a little bit, a little bit, little, we'll get to where we want to go. That's the planning approach. Totally not what we're looking for here. System change is when we flip from one um, paradigm, one way of doing things to, to a totally different one. And really what we're looking for is kind of a tipping point, right? So if we think about something like the internet, that was quite quiet. It was invented back in the 1960s. It was relatively quiet for a long time. And then came the World Wide Web and boom, the internet blew up, right? No one had the internet way back then in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Nobody was very interested in it. Suddenly we got the World Wide Web and email and we got network effects and everybody, now everybody wants to be on the internet, right? So we're actually up here. And in a short space of time, 20 years or so, this information system became incredibly dominant in our world. Um, it's almost, uh, it's, it's a paradigm shift, the world without the internet to the world with the internet. That's the kind of uh, change we're talking about, that flipping, that exponential, the speed at which the internet grew. Um, almost a million people were joining every day, uh, the internet at one stage. Um, that's, that's what we mean by um, paradigm shift and nonlinear change. So it's about measuring the patterns um, in the system. If that's what we're trying to change in systems change, then we should be assessing um, for that. So systems change does not attempt to tackle specific symptoms, but instead change the structure of the system to make it more resilient and sustainable. As such, and, and healthy, really, that's ultimately kind of the aim of systems change. How can we make this system regenerative instead of degenerative? How can we make it a healthy living system instead of one that's um, disintegrating? So that's what we should be assessing for, that generative capacity, that health of the system. Um, and that's a lot about the structure, the way it's organized. As such, what we wish to measure for with system change is not the change in any part, um, but the the quality, the integrity, and the functioning of the whole system. It's a different kind of metric to traditional impact measures, uh, one that accounts for the change in the structure and patterns. So these here are some ways of thinking about, we say the structure of the system, and that's a bit abstract, and you'd wonder how do we assess that? Uh, it's, it's quite easy for us to assess the changes in the parts, right? How many products did you create? How many students did you educate? How many, you know, um, vaccines did you deliver and so forth? That's what our traditional metrics are around. Here we're saying, that's not what systems change is about. It's change in system structure. So how do you actually assess a thing like that? And these are a number, uh, this is one way of doing it. It's not the only way. Um, it's saying these are a number of uh, dimensions that we can look at and think about in assessing the change in system structure. So we can think about the integrity, we'll kind of break these down in a minute. Um, the integrity of the system, how interconnected is it? The synergies between the parts, 
the alignment of those parts and the adaptive capacity um, and evolutionary capacity of that system. This is what's going to make for a healthy system, a functioning overall system. So we'll just take a quick look at some of those. Um, this one here, integrity. How interconnected is this system? If all the parts are separate, we're not going to have a system that's working together. Um, so when you're trying to do systems change, when you're going into a context, you're trying to build a new ecosystem, a new set of actors who are working together in a new way. And if they're all disconnected, nothing's going to happen. So the first thing is to question, are these actors actually interconnected in the way that needs to be interconnected? Or are we dealing with a, a bunch of silos, right, where nothing's going to happen? So this is the first kind of metric we might want to think about. What level of connectivity do we have here? If we're talking about improving the water system in South Africa, do we have a hundred different, you know, organizations, enterprises, and another 50 different government and regional departments in South Africa who are managing water and none of them are talking to each other? That's not going to work. We're not going to get a good system like that. So our first question would be, how connected is this? Our first assessment is how interconnected is this? And if it's not interconnected, first thing we do is try and start connecting it, we start convening, we'd have forums, we'd have discussions, we'd have conferences, so that people can, and networking events, so that people can get together and start getting connected. And that's gonna be the ground condition for this system to start functioning as a whole. So that's one of the first things we'd want to assess. This is what, in a, in a minute, we'll be using this for our little workshop down here. So you'll have a chance to um, think about these for yourself. Um, I'll just stay walking through them. The second one might be around synergies. If these parts are now interconnected, how are they actually working together? Are they involved in a lot of competition that is pointless, it's just recreating the wheel? Um, or are they actually working together synergistically? If we want a functioning healthy system, then we will need these actors uh, working together synergistically. So that's a key consideration when we go into almost any system. Firstly, are the actors interconnected? If they are, once they are, are they working in a net, do they have negative synergies or positive synergies? Negative synergies means they're working in a destructive way. So they're, they're, they're counter um, productive in what they're doing as a whole. Um, or is it positive synergies? They're working in synergistic ways. So in that example of, of South Africa and the water system, do we have lots of water companies that are all competing um, and recreating their own little systems? And um, that would lead to a suboptimal overall system, or could we get them working together in synergistic ways? So that's the second consideration. Um, thirdly, we might wanna think about uh, alignment. Are these actors, actually working together in some way as a whole towards the overall challenge. If the overall challenge here in South Africa was conserving water because we haven't got much of it, are they all aligned in that? Are they interconnected? Are they working together? And are they aligned towards that overall purpose of trying to conserve and recycle and create a, a um, circular water system? Or are they all going in different directions? Nobody knows what anyone else is doing. They have no conception, no vision of the overall system they're part of. So we'd want to assess for that also. Uh, finally, we want to think about the adaptive capacity and um, evolutionary capacity of the system to make it sustainable, to make it give it capacity to um, evolve, adapt, and change over time it's going to need some kind of adaptive um, capacity or is it, is it held in a fixed kind of hierarchical structure or um, does it have this flexible network structure for it to be able to, this bottom up uh, network structure for it to be able to adapt and evolve. So those are just four um, key dimensions that we'd want to think about as to the health of this overall system. And here are some considerations in um, assessing the systems change. 
in any project you might be working on. And of course, systems change exists in, you know, across all kinds of systems. So is your assessment, is what you're assessing an assessment of the parts or is it an assessment of the connections and structure of the system? Are you assessing for systems integrity, synergies, alignment, resilience, these sorts of things? What's the data you're using? Is it contextual data about these connections and relationships or is it decontextualized data about the individual parts? How can we recontextualize it? Are you doing ethnographic assessments um, that are actually looking at um, this in the context of people's lives in the city? According to whose criteria are you measuring? Yours or the people in the system? Are your metrics transparent? So some of this stuff, it's in the guide. We won't go into all of it now about collecting data and so forth. Um, you can dig into the guide and find out more about it there. Um, so finally here a little bit about um, investing for systems change. Um, it's quite a hot topic uh, at the moment. Again, it's going to be a very different, very different um, paradigm to investing in the parts. This is what we normally do, this reductionist thing. We try to find the best part in the system and um, invest in that one part and exclude all the others. And um, then we duplicate that part and try to scale it out. So it's about funneling down to the best, best element in the system, the best startup, the best social enterprise, whatever it is. Um, it's a reduction process. Uh, it's about investing in the parts, aiming to find the best one. It's a selection process um, and uh, kind of private investment. What we're talking about here is a more holistic uh, approach to investing, where we're trying to invest in the health and uh, growth of the system. And it's a more expansive, multi-dimensional, um, multi-value, that there are many different types of value in the system that we need to be accounting for and investing in, maybe not just money, but also social capital, ecological capital, we need to think about investing in connections, building synergies and, and integration um, across the system. It's about building the commons instead of just one part. And this is often expressed as what we call the portfolio approach, where we're looking at many different initiatives and how we may invest um, in those different initiatives and then coordinate and get synergies between them so that we can actually shift the system. Um, so I won't go too much into this investing today. It's a whole whole nother subject. Um, as mentioned, there's a video down there where we did an interesting interview. There's more in the guide and so forth. If you're interested, portfolio approaches is often what it's called. You could take a look at that. Um, number of different organizations already um, applying this logic and working with portfolio approaches. I want to um, jump into the workshop so I don't spend all my time lecturing today. Um, this is the canvas we'll, we'll be looking at, uh, assessing systems health. Um, this one here is really thinking about these different dimensions to the system that I talked about. There's another one up here. Um, I've link, got the link down below. It's taking a holistic um, assessment of the different impacts that you may, may have. If you're doing an initiative or something here, what is the impact that's having across all these different systems uh, around it? That's another one you might want to look at. But here we are. Hopefully you found the mirror board. Uh, maybe Manali could share that. Uh, with you again. Yeah, it looks like the link's there. So I welcome you to jump in. We're going to take a little exercise for you to um, think about this yourself. Um, the challenge is a circular economy in this city and assessing for how well we're doing in moving that system towards a circular economy. Lots of different ways we could do that by just assessing, you know, the different um, organizations themselves or different services or products. But Taking what we learned today, how could we assess the systems change that's taking place in terms of how integrated are the different initiatives? We think about a circular economy, many different things across that system that need to happen and they need to be interconnected, they need to be coordinated and um, collaborating in different ways. So the first thing is, are these different parts interconnected across the different dimensions? Could be water, you know, materials, food, um, so on and so forth. Uh, the different policies being introduced by government, the, the different um, 
enterprises and their supply chains and how commerce is working and so forth. This is a very complex challenge, um, shifting a large city to a, circ a fully circular um, model would be a real paradigm shift. And it's not just about the parts, it really is about that interconnection um, and that system transformation, because as we know, um, cities like this are very much siloed. Um, we don't really have a, a fully circular economy city. So the first one we'll take a look at um, is this one around uh, integration. How would we actually assess, this is gonna test your, your thinking now, how would we assess for how interconnected and how well these different parts, let's just say how interconnected they are at this stage around this challenge of um, moving to a circular economy. So please grab a sticky and uh, place down there. We're gonna develop our assessment, our metrics, what we're looking at when we're assessing this city for how close it's moving towards becoming a circular city. Um, so we'll just take one or two minutes on this one, and then we'll, we'll discuss and move on to the next ones. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Anybody has a question about um, some of the stuff we've already covered? We covered quite a bit, but if anyone has a question, uh, I'm happy to try and answer it at this time or about this uh, little exercise here. Feel free to post in the chat or you can unmute yourself also if you wish. I've got, a, I've got a question, Joss, around, um, so if you have like loads of different, I guess, people within the system who are in that kind of competition space, how you shift from that um, to kind of getting people to work together towards the common aim? Yeah, well, this is, this is it, isn't it, Shelley? Um, well, I think you need to make an assessment of the system first, uh, excuse the pun, but... Um, you need to see what really is a situation where really is the potential. 
um, if you really are in this situation of competition and no one wanting to work together, um, then you probably need to create something new in the system, right? A new attractor of some kind. Um, so people often ask that question because one of the most obvious questions when it comes to system change is, okay, most systems, when in need of system change, you'll find that it's developed with large actors and they're, they're, they're the, the incumbents and they've become inert and they don't want to change and so forth. So what do you do in that situation? And my answer to that is always you, you assess the situation. Is that really the situation? Um, and then you think about where the potential is and where you can create new attractors in that system where you're creating a new space, something new that actually delivers some kind of value in that system that um, the actors can't really get anywhere else. And that's going to attract them to that, whether it's those incumbents or whether it's new individuals, new entrants, whatever it is, and you're going to grow something from that attractor. So it's creating value and eventually those people and others will be attracted to that. And it may be a question that you have to actually disrupt those incumbents, right? Because they're so inert. Um, or it may be that over time, they see the value of what you're doing and they're attracted into that. And what you're doing has built into it a kind of collaborative uh, platform that enables them to work together. Um, so that's that's my answer to that, that question. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I'll have a little think about the, the value add. Cheers. Sure. Okay, let's um, take a look at the, uh, Henry. Did you want to mention something? Yes, I just want to write out another point where, where is it uh, regarding competition? It is, is you can motivate uh, organizations to say that uh, do you want to be part and lead the change or you're just going to be a follower uh, later on? Uh, because many see today we're going towards circularity, for instance, do we be part of the uh, form the change and, and, and be a, yeah. be a forerun forerunner where you're just going to then, you know, step in later on uh, yeah. and be a, be a latecomer, you know? Yeah. So, so that's a good point. I mean, back to Shelley, your question, I mean, there's all different ways of, of responding to that challenge and that's why I said you have to assess it first to really see how inert these actors are um, if they really don't want to change then you do what what I said which is kind of create something new and disrupt it but if they are open to change then you can do things like Henry said and you know um, entice them to be those forerunners and highlight them and you of course what you can always do is try and w figure out what is the value that's created by all of us working together and then go to them and say you know if we work together we can achieve this and it'll be a ben benefit to you um, so that would be the first thing. If they are very open to those changes, uh, potential changes, um, then you would start with kind of what Henry was saying or with explaining to them the value of being part of something, a new system, um, a new kind of overall structure that they could get value from. But quite often, well, sometimes some of those actors really don't want to change um, and it requires some kind of disruption or the creation of something new. So, yeah. Thanks for that, Henry. Anyone else uh, before we look at this? Uh, so Bob, uh, what type of components could uh, constitute a social system? Uh, people, organizations, uh, institutions, companies. Um, yeah, those would be the components of a social system. Okay, so. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, so we're talking about um, assessing for integration. How would we assess for integration? That is how interconnected these different organizations, these different um, parts to this city um, are, these different systems and the actors in them when it comes to uh, working towards circular systems. So uh, who's this? This is when, when Roland, uh, what are the unused outputs? What are we um, importing from the outside system? Run a social network analysis. Yeah, that would be uh, one way, see how connected these people are. Are these local groups sharing knowledge and resources? Yep. How can we format the communications to improve shared meaning yeah so it might require 
um, creating some kind of shared meaning. Maybe they've never even heard of circular economy. Um, and maybe some of the actors are doing interesting things, but they aren't aware that others are. And you'd have to come in with maybe some sort of a narrative or something that helps them see themselves as something common. Maybe they don't even understand the concept of circular economy um, yet. Okay, communications flows. Yes, communications is are clearly key. We're, we're, we'll be creating some kind of new organization here and communications is really central to that. So we'd have to, we could assess that. How actually, what are the channels of communications? Um, are there social networks here? Or maybe that's something we need to be um, creating. Are there forums where these people can get together and uh, network and discuss this stuff? Um, evidence of communications, yeah. Joint funding bids, yep. Existence of networks, forums that connect actors. Yeah, different ways for connecting these actors, different spaces for them to connect. Um, so we're doing an assessment of whether those exist already. Output from what uh, and from where. Hmm. Yeah, so it could be um, looking at, you know, partnerships between different organizations. Um, and uh, contracts, agreements, uh, supply chains, are they working together in delivering products and services, so on and so forth. Okay, so that was the first one. Let's maybe jump across to synergies. Um, how would we assess for this in the context of this uh, circular city? How do we assess, are there synergies? Are these, these actors working, synergies about actors being differentiated so that they're doing different things but then also coordinated. So they're actually um, working together on things. How would we assess for that? Let's take a couple of minutes to think about that. If you have any questions relating to any of this, feel free to unmute yourself or put them in the chat.
Okay, let's take a look at this here. Synergies is about how well the parts are working together. Um, if we think about something like the circular economy here, um, this synergies, if they weren't working together, we get a lot of companies maybe producing the same product or trying to do the same thing and compete with each other. Um, when you think about all the marketing and all the sales and all the resources that go into kind of, you know, 10 companies producing toothpaste or something, um, when if they're able to collaborate and differentiate, you could potentially get um, those resources used in a much more effective, much more effective way. Um, so that's a key consideration. Um, think about something like GDP, it's just going to look at how much this system is producing. But if we really wanted um, kind of quality of life and uh, a circular economy and this thing to be working well, it's, it's a question of those parts working well together. So that's actually being effective in the overall use of those resources. And that's what we mean by synergies here. Um, so uh, what, what do we have? Um, Evidence is from Shelley. Evidence of stakeholders uh, specializing in different sections of the cycle and working together to complete the process. Yeah, supply chains, I guess, would be a good example or potentially. Um, ask actors to name who they cooperate with and who they compete with. Compare ego maps to overall network. Look for gaps in the system. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good one. Looking for gaps, that's something we could be assessing for too. Um, listen, is there are there actors that should be here that are missing? Are there things here that should be missing? We should be assessing for that. Um, compare ego maps to overall network. Okay, law and regulations that allow for transfer of responsibility of materials between stakeholders, um, industrial symbiosis. Yeah, do we, and, it's industrial symbiosis is often actors being placed in the same say industrial park or wherever it is so they're able to um, directly transfer materials or energy or heat or so forth do we see those kind of things um, those kind of um, ecosystems going on industrial symbiosis ecosystems where actors maybe different actors are, are choosing to place themselves near to each other to get those material flows henry do you want to mention something yeah, often uh, stakeholders are willing to cooperate, but the regulation does not all in them. I've worked a lot or talked a lot with people in the uh, Kolomborg symbiosis and in paper province. Yep. And they say, for instance, we want to, but for instance, in Sweden, the municipal waste is controlled on, uh, is controlled by municipality. So they are in control of anything that is considered waste. So even if there's only 10 meters between two companies, they can't just transport it to the next next door. Mm. Of, legally, they have to transport it away and need, need to be then treated in a certain way so it's not harmful any, anymore. And mm. then in theory, they could go back then to it. But, so it, it is often a legal aspect where it hinders actually the stakeholders to cooperate closer. Great, thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, exactly, and that's something we'll be looking at. Do those issues with laws exist that um, are preventing those collaborations? And there, there can be many other reasons um, also. Okay, thank you. Um, break silo thinking and make all stakeholders sign up for common, uh, common good agreements. Uh, yep, so um, evidence of more impactful outputs created through collaboration. Um, yeah, I guess this is what we do to try and change that system, not necessarily evidence of more impactful outputs created through collaboration. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we're assessing for, um, right? Do those exist, those kind of symbiosis um, and evidence of it? Through sharing realities, uh, through sharing realities, we can assess connections between unused resources, waste, and needed inputs. Yeah, it's a good point. Communicating, because this would be a big part of it, right? Most of the people don't know what's going on here and who exists. Um, so communications, as you say, is really key, really key to all of this. Um, just knowing 
that you know I'm a chicken farmer or whatever it is, um, and who could actually use that waste uh, that that, that uh, is produced from the chickens? Um, so communications, having ways of broadcasting that uh, to create those synergies. Okay. Um, level of transparency, openness, willingness. Yes, data sharing, um, visibility across the system to be able to form those collaborations, conflict of interest between uh, stakeholders. Yeah, is there proper differentiation would be part of the question. You know, is everyone trying to do the same thing here? Or are people properly separating out to do different functions? Because that's the interesting thing. You only get synergies when you get differentiation. If everyone's doing the same thing, you're going to get competition. Um, so looking at that, um, the urbanism tries to guarantee the minimum organization amongst the transportation uh, model, modals. However, even the space separates pedestrians and vehicles. It doesn't work very well in practice. Yep. Uh, cities, our cities are full of kind of negative synergies like noise pollution or, you know, tarmac where water hits it and it doesn't get used properly and it starts flooding and so forth. Um, plenty of those. Uh, okay, this one here, example, a brewery. So this was our people uh, through sharing realities. Yeah, so example, a brewery has a lot of waste uh, from its operations. Someone want to tell us about this one? Who, who is this? Uh, when do you want to tell us about this? Yeah, it's an example we have here in Montreal. Uh, a brewery is, is uh, brewing beer and all the waste from the up uh, treatment and brewing process is used by a mushroom company uh, growing mushroom on these wastes. And these at the end, it's compost. And this compost can be used to grow up that goes into making beer and, you know, mm. very, very... Uh, complete circle in there. Super, lovely example. Lovely example of the synergy. Um, great, so let's move on uh, to have time for these last two. Alignment. So do these actors have alignment around this common vision of becoming a circular city? Um, how are we gonna assess for that one? It's slightly different. It's a little bit similar to synergies, a little bit similar to connection. Um, but now I think it's looking at kind of the overall picture. Are these actors working towards the same um, same thing uh, as a whole? Because uh, there could be just those individual synergies, you know, the one you just said, Wed, but then at a broader scale, are we getting that alignment to work towards um, what we want to achieve here, this circular economy? So let's just take a couple of minutes, um, please, to um, post up any ideas how we might assess for this one.
Yep. When? Just a quick question. Um, what we're, what we're looking for is the signs that there are alignments or um, mm. how would how would we assess for this? Uh, yeah. What okay. would we be looking for? What would we be looking for? Okay. Um, hmm. I understand. Thanks. I know. I know. It's challenging. It's a challenging question, right? It's not straightforward. Um, it's, um, it's a good question. Okay, uh, just for the sake of time, uh, we'll jump in, take a quick look. Um, so mission orientated objectives. Yeah, I think it's a lot, a lot of what it's about. Is there an overall conception of where we're going? Um, is there a purpose to this overall thing? Um, do people have a sense of why, why we'd be working together as a whole? Um, so I think mission oriented objectives, mission oriented um, innovation is a good example. Uh, network analysis over time for uh, reassessment of the network and seeing how actors have changed their direction to integrate previous decisions and goals. Yeah, if you think about systems change, it's going to result systems change we're typically entering into a system that's become very fractured um, and it has no overall functioning really its overall functioning is degraded significantly and part of what we're going to be doing in a, in a system change initiative is actually revitalizing that sense of a whole and that sense of um, being part of a whole that has a purpose that has a function as a whole is really what that's what a living uh, functioning system is gonna gonna do it's working as a whole so part of that process is the system and the actors in it becoming aware of themselves um, in some broader context that they didn't really exist in before they didn't understand themselves in before um, so this alignment thing is going to be a lot of assessment here is do these actors, are they aware of being part of something more than just their own uh, little, little sphere and wanting to be part of that and wanting to be aligned, wanting to contribute to that and be aligned with it. That's almost, all, that's always going to be there. You know, you're always kind of uh, taking to the system to another level of awareness about itself and it's, it's functioning together. Um, and that will be key to this. I, I guess it'll always often be expressed in stories and um, shared narratives and, and terminology like the circular economy, right? So we've been recycling for thousands of years, but it's only more recently we adopted this word and now cities are thinking about it and they're thinking about how they can work together um, to do that. So that's kind of the emergence of a shared narrative, shared terminology that gets can start to get alignment and working together of these actors. And that's something you'll probably be uh, assessing for. So shared ideas of impact. Yeah, and whether, whether actors are really motivated towards that, whether they're really um, you know, going that direction, maybe the climate change thing and um, net zero is an example. We see all these companies around the planet decarbonizing now, right? Microsoft paying uh, millions of dollars to buy carbon um, credits. So, so, so they're aligned with this overall mission of reducing carbon, getting to zero, zero carbon and tackling climate change. So that's, that's taken a whole new level of awareness about ourselves and our relationship with the ecosystem and, and um, CO2 emissions and climate change before we got to that level where all, many, many organizations are now aligning themselves with this overall purpose um, and trying to decarbonize. Um, so that'd be one example. So level, levels of accountability against actions uh, taken towards 
yeah, so there should be emerging some kind of uh, accounting system that's going to be part of this, um, like the, you know, the net zero, where everybody's starting to account for their carbon. Um, that will be part of this uh, process. Uh, shared values and principles relating to ways of working, uh, target stakeholder groups. Great. Unfortunately, uh, we've hit our time li limit. Um, we'll try to finish on time. So hopefully you found that beneficiary beneficial and it helped you to think about this in practice and kind of work through it. We didn't get a chance to look at this last one, which is really about the adaptive capacity of the system. If it's gonna survive over time, it needs to navigate uh, processes of crisis and regeneration and so forth. So we need to assess for that. Are we dealing with a very rigid system, um, inflexible or siloed so forth, or, or is it adaptive? Does it have that capacity to um, resilience, I guess is part of what we're talking about now. Okay, uh, well done everyone. So that was um, a learning session on how to assess for impact uh, when doing uh, systems change, systems innovation. It would be very similar whether you're doing it in sector economy, whether this was an education system, whether you're trying to revitalize your local economy in your community, you'd be essentially assessing for the same things that have the same uh, relevance. And you'll find here, as mentioned, the resources, the guides with all those ideas. You can go more in depth, the canvases, we just use the canvas and that vision, that video um, if you're interested in the investing uh, aspect of all of this, here are some of our links. If you want to uh, find us, we'll have the recording on YouTube uh, afterwards. Um, so that's actually the last of these events in this series. We're going to start again in September with a, a revitalized uh, series on, on the Systems Innovation Guides. You're welcome to join us again. Then we'll post that event soon. We're going to wrap up now, but we'd love to have any uh, feedback, feedback you'd like to share. Um, did you get a good understanding of the concepts today? Was the format of the session effective in helping you understand it? Any ideas for how we may improve it? Just grab a sticky, drag it to the right um, if things were going good, and you could post up some ideas if, um, if you have some. Great, thank you all for joining. Uh, we'll wrap up there. I hope to see you again in a future session. Thanks very much. See ya. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Um, have a good day. Thanks, Joss.